Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mick Bikamian, Senior Master, Director, Organizer, and Owner of the Los Angeles Chess Club. <coughs> in the series of planning in chess, I would like to show you guys one of my best games ever when it comes to planning today. This game was for the City Championship of Houston in 1996. I've won the title three times in 1990, 93, and 96. This was round four, the final game against uh, a player named Jerry Garrisman, a national master. And uh, from the three previous games, we both had three wins. So the winner of this game becomes city champ for another three years. I'm very proud of this game because not only I did a planning that uh, turned out to be not perfectly fine, but fine, it worked fine, but also I force made it my opponent uh, within two or three moves at the very end, which is not so easy to do this to a master. So this was a game that I prepared for it for a whole week, and I played an opening for the first time. Of course, I looked at some opening lines in that particular line, which is called the Kali system. The setup with Kali, these are the first four moves of it. D4, knight f3, e3, bishop d3. This setup is called Cowley system. And when Edgar Cowley himself used to play this line, which he pioneered it, he used to play what's called C3 Cowley. The trouble with this setup was this bishop, a dark square bishop hemmed in by dark square pawns. And white will eventually strive to play E4 at some point and get this bishop out. So chess theoreticians, they noticed this setup and they improved on it. The improvement was what's called today as B3 Kali, or the Zuckertort Kali, because Zuckertort, one of the rivals of Steinitz World Championship, first world champion, he played this system quite often. So this setup is called Zuckertort Kali, or B3 Kali, or modern Kali. So this is the setup that I used in this game. So, I opened with d4. My opponent is uh, a classical player. When you know something about your opponent's style, that helps to find the most optimal setup against it. He played e6. It's a flexible move. If I play e4 now, he plays d5, and he is very good with French defense. So I had that option. If I play d4, he plays d5, and we have a queen's gambit. Nothing wrong with that. So I play knight f3. A flexible move that white plays in such positions anyway, unless somebody wants to go for the, the stonewall variation, which I wasn't planning on it. So knight f3, he played a flexible move also. Knight f6. Now, if white wants to play in the spirit of the queen's gambit, normally he would play c4. And of course, black will play d5, and we have a queen's gambit. But like I said, I was planning to play college system. So I played knight bd2. The main idea behind this move is to play e4. And of course, this is something black doesn't want to allow white to play. So black played d5, a move that he was planning to play anyway. And this pretty much goes along with the kind of setups that he is used to, which is a classical formation. Now I played e3, and he played bishop e7. And I played bishop d3. So I got my colleague set up in order, and black castled. You notice the way black has played, almost no matter what white plays, on his setup with the queen pawn openings, this is the black setup for classical players. No matter what white does, these are the first five moves of black. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with this setup. Some of the greatest players in history, they played this quite often, like Karpov, like Anand, even Kasparov. This is the classical way to start the game with. So we haven't reached the planning stage yet. Planning usually comes right after the opening is over. So I castled, and black played b6. 
Okay, this move is understandable. He's about to play bishop here, or possibly here, try to trade his bad bishop against white's good bishop. As you know, a bad bishop is bishop that is hemmed in with his own square, central color squares. So theoretically, this is black's good bishop, opposite color of his central pawn, and this is his bad bishop. While for white, this is his good bishop, opposite color of his central pawns, and this is his bad bishop. So this de definitely benefits black to go here and trade bishops. So I played b6, and I played b3. I have the same problem with this dark square bishop and these dark square pawns. So Fionchero in the bishop makes sense. And plus, this is part of the college system anyway. And black Fionchero the bishop, and white Fionchero mine. And now he played a move, a6. Well, like I said, I had a whole week to prepare for this game. And I went over 20 top level games in this particular opening. When you play for such an important title, city championship, good for three years, you want to make sure you've done your homework. And about 20 games that I went over, in none of those I saw that black playing this move, a6. And I was a little bit surprised, <coughs> and I didn't see anything good about this move. And so I asked my opponent after the game, what was the point of this move? Because I couldn't understand. He said, well, I'm trying to dislodge the bishop from here, so I was planning to play c5, followed by b5, and that's the point of a6, followed by c4, and dislodge the bishop from this great square, which is a kind of faulty plan, because the moment he plays c5, I intended to trade pawns in order to open my dark square bishop diagonal towards the king's side. So this whole plan was faulty. So that's the first weakness on his part, a6. It is white to play now, and I'll play knight e5. This is just a natural square for knight in the center, an outpost, as we call it. And I'm about to strengthen that knight, possibly with f4, which is called the stonewall setup, or knight df3, and I strengthen the knight with another knight to come in. Isn't the weakness of playing um, f4 that the knight has an outpost on e4? Black has a knight uh, outpost on e4, right. That's the only problem e4, with it. E4, but then black has that wonderful outpost. Right, and that's why I didn't go with that setup. That's the biggest problem with that setup. White, white plays f4 to strengthen this knight here, but at the same time gives this square to black. So that's a problem with color with the stone wall, and that's why I decided not to play that. I decided to play a positional line instead. So I play knight e5, and it's black's move, and black played c5 as part of the plan. Usually in queen pawn openings, it's a good idea for both players to push the c pawn. Unless white, like in this case, play, is playing the Kali system. In Kali system, white usually doesn't touch his c2 pawn. Of course, he can push it to c4 at some point. So on c5, I intended to trade pawns. So I played pawn takes, and he played pawn takes. OK, we have made exactly 10 moves so far. So when you want to do your planning, you should wait until the opening is over, and then assess the position based on the strength and weaknesses, and do your plan. Here, I spent about 35 minutes to do my planning. In a long time control game, 35 minutes is normal to spend that much time on planning. When you want to plan, you should come up with a dream position, dream setup. It's as if you could make 10 moves in a row. What would you do if you could make 10 moves in a row here? How do you create an attacking position? Well, it would be nice I'll play knight here, then knight here, then queen here, then queen here, striking at black's weakest spot. Then maybe play f4, maybe rook f3, maybe this rook here, maybe this rook here, and wow, I got a winning position. Trouble is, you can't even make two moves in a row. But wouldn't it be nice if we could do like this? We'd be world champion quickly. So, that's one thing to keep in mind when you want to do your planning. 
There's a story that Capablanca, when he went to Moscow in 1925 to give a simultaneous exhibition, he gave the simul, of course, he beat everybody in there. Among the players, there was a 14-year-old boy named Mikhail Batvinik. And he, he asked Capablanca, how do you plan to earn a game? Great question from a 14-year-old. So Capablanca, Batvinik even had a position with him. Like in this position, how do you plan? So Capablanca looked at the position and he started moving the pieces around and he said, doesn't this position look great now? So yes, good, now work towards it, build it. So this is the idea that I always had in mind when you want to do your planning, you should uh, keep that in mind, come up with a dream position and build it, work towards it. So this is where I started my dreaming. I said, if I could make several moves in a row, what would I do? I came up with a three-phase plan that two of, them ha two of them happened, the third one didn't happen. The third one was my opponent's plan that I was trying to deal with. So I said in this position, I would love to have my queen on the king's side. So this queen over here, for example, or g3, that's on the king's side. That would be fantastic. And it takes a couple of, just two moves to do that. What else could I do? Once I get the queen off the back rank, my rooks get connected. So I like to bring the rooks to the game. Where do the rooks belong? One plan is to play f4, rook f3, and rook g3, possibly. It's called Pillsbury attack. Another positional approach would be to put the rooks on an open file. Open file is a file that has no pawns in it. We don't have an open file here. Next best thing for rooks is half open file. Half open file is a file that only one side has in pawn in it. So right now we have the D, D file that is half open and the B file. The B file cannot benefit black because even if it puts a rook on the B8, this pawn is supported with two pawns. It's really biting on granite. So, but my half open file could be useful towards the black queen. So I figured once I get the queen off the back rank, then my rooks get connected. I put, a rooks on, put rooks on C and D file, or possibly double on the D file, and that looks good. My rooks get activated. Okay, it is nice to come up with a plan and execute it, but you cannot neglect what your opponent might do. You have to take that in consideration also. You see, good chess players, masters, they don't just plan for their own games. They plan for their opponents, and they try to neutralize what what, whatever your opponent, their opponent's plan is uh, consists of. So I said, what is Black's plan in this position? Uh, I figured that this pawn push, I have to watch out for any one of these pawn pushes at any moment. I figured this pawn push cannot be good because I'm on it one, two, three, four times, and it's only defended once. So I just win the pawn, be pawn up. What about this pawn push? My plan on this pawn push is to advance the e-pawn, and even though I block my bishop diagonal, I will have what's called qualitative, quantitative, um, I'm sorry, qualitative advantage. F4, and these four pawns against these black pawns that are back, I will have a good advantage, plus that I get this new outpost for my pieces. So he will have a backward pawn here, isolated pawn here. So I wasn't worried about neither one of these pawn pushes that I had to watch out for constantly. So I figured Black's best counterattack in this position was to get rid of this isolated pawn, advance it, and give a scope to a rook, and start attacking on the A-file. This was Black's best plan, which, by the way, he never used during the game. So I spent 35 minutes at this point to come up with these three phases. And of course, during the game, you have no idea how many phases you have. You don't know where one begins, the other one ends, and all that. But when you analyze the game at home afterwards, that's when you, when you put everything on paper, that's when you realize how many phases you actually had. So when I did that, I realized that I came up with a three-phase plan. Shifting the queen to the king's side, activating rooks, and stopping black's counterattack. If black continues with this, I was intending to stop it with a4. And there's nothing that can take place over here. So, with that in mind, I played the first move, shifting the queen to the king's side. 
It is black to play, and black played knight c6. Okay, I knew this knight is going to be challenged. He took advantage of the fact that I cannot defend this knight with the knight on f3, and immediately challenged my knight. So I took, you see, I'm opening my dark light square, dark square bishop diagonal, and light square is already open. These two snipers, as they're called, I'm hoping that uh, they win the game for me, bearing down on the king's side. So he took with the bishop, and now played queen h3. Phase one completed, shifting the queen to the king's side. And with this move, I just create a new threat. Can anybody see what white's threat is? It's black to play, but if it were white to play, what would he do? What do you think? Excellent. Bishop takes knight, removing the guard of this square. And if he plays bishop takes or pawn takes, doesn't matter which one, queen takes mate, right? It's pretty obvious. And I didn't expect him to fall for this. Masters usually see these things quickly. Okay. He spent about 10 minutes at this point, And while he was thinking, I knew which move he's going to make. You see, if black were a hypermodern player, he would play this move. Because so many times they have this position and the bishop, fiancher or bishop, they have a better feel for such pawn structures. This guy was a classical player. So he played this move. I knew he was gonna make this move. So I already was thinking of my next move. As he played this move, it's my turn. And like I said, my plan was to activate my rooks. So rook fd1, was the correct move that I should have played. However, in my rush, I figured, before I do that, if I put this knight to f3 and e5, fantastic outpost for the knight, attacking an undefended piece, that looks good. Why don't I do that first? Well, trouble with this move was that black completely surprised me. You see, this pawn was objectively not a good move that he made earlier, but it helped him, and now, he plays bishop b5, and there is no way I can avoid trading the light square bishops. Of course, c4 fails to pawn takes pawn, and my bishop is exposed to the queen. So this is what actually happened in the game, and I was kind of disappointed that I missed bishop b5. So the question is, how would this rook fd1 had prevented, would have prevented bishop b5? Right, it doesn't prevent it, he can still play bishop b5. But, it, but I can avoid trading bishops by playing c4 now. And if he plays pawn takes pawn, I'll take back with the knight, and my bishop is guarded. He create another isolated pawn for himself, a great outpost, and, and bishop h7 threatening check and winning the queen is also. So this position is great for white. So this is the mo correct move that I should have played, rook fd1. However, even by miss with missing this move, this game is still turned out to be one of my best games. So I played knight f3. Sure enough, he played bishop b5. And now I have to worry about trading bishops, which there's nothing I can do. Question is, should I tra take his bishop or should I let him take me? Well, I definitely wasn't gonna trade the bishop because by playing bishop takes, pawn takes, this pawn no longer would be isolated. So I get rid of one of his major weaknesses in this position. So I figured I'll let him take me. So I play knight e5. And of course he was happy to trade bishops. Again, I have two choices. Should I take this bishop with the pawn or with the knight? There's one choice that is clearly better than the other. Pawn, then you advance it towards the center and the knight's at an outpost. Exactly. Taking with a pawn is better because I have my outpost, knight over here. If I take with the knight, then he will have his own outpost also. But if I take with a pawn, I'll take his outpost away. In the meantime, my knight is beautifully posted. And you have two pawns in the center. And I have another pawn center. And when it comes to pawn structure, something changes though. By moving the pawn to the D file, this file becomes closed, and we, I have a near half open file, C file. 
So this is, as far as pawn structure, this is the only big change. So that's what I did. It's black to play now. Now my threat is forking here, and I'll be happy to trade my knight with that bishop. Then as a result of this trade, we end up with one minor piece on its side, and mine has an offensive role, and his is just a sitting duck. So for the rest of the game, I'll be attacking along this diagonal. So this is a definitely favor favorable ending for white. So that was my threat. So he played queen b6 and controlled this square. It's white to play now. Could you chase this queen around? Oh, no, no. I can't. I, I weaken myself. I didn't see that white. So it's white to play now. So my second phase of the plan was activating my rooks. So I figured with this half open file, I need to double my rooks on the C file. So I'll play rook fc1. Some people may say, why not rook ac1? I could do that too. Trouble is, I immediately weaken this pawn. So I'm trying to weaken this for as late as possible. And when I played rook ac1, he played rook ac8. I was very happy to see this move because he brought the wrong rook to the C file. Why? Because he needed this rook here to advance the C A pawn and get rid of this isolated pawn and open an attacking line along the F file, A file. You see, white C pawn moved from C2 to D3. That means this pawn complex got a little bit weaker. And now A5 followed by A4 was definitely the plan that black should have continued. But he completely missed this plan. And because you play the same opponent over and over over years, you want to know what they're thinking, how they're thinking, what they saw, what they didn't see. That's why after your games, it's a good idea to analyze the game with the opponent. It doesn't matter whether you win, lose, or draw. You get to see what they were thinking. Plus, it's, you could learn something. You never know, even from low-rated opponent. So after the game, after the game, I asked him, did you consider the idea of advancing the A pawn all the way? He said, yeah, but it would have been two pawn moves in a row, and there was, uh, it, was, it wasn't so much to do. Yes, it's true, it's two pawn moves in a row, but when there's nothing else in the position to do, one of the things you can do is to repair your position, repair your weaknesses. This isolated pawn is spreading gloom all over Black's position, and he never moved this pawn. That's why rook fc8 was the correct move by black, and of course, with the idea of advancing the a pawn. So you see, he played rook a c8. So I figured when he played this move, he had not even considered the idea of advancing the a pawn, which is not good anymore. So while you're doing your plan, and you're following the steps that you envisioned earlier, if a new tactical opportunity comes up, by all means, you should go for it. So here I set a trap for black. Oh, uh, no, it's just queen takes. I played queen g3. With this, I just create a new threat. It's black to play, but if it were white, what would be the threat here? Exactly. Knight d7, forking the queen and rook. And the knight on f6 is frozen. He cannot play knight takes knight because of so queen g7 checkmate. Very good. So what did he do? Well, again, against when you play master, this is easy to see. Even though your opponent may see your threat and they deal with it, it, does, it should not stop you from making them because that's how you improve your position. He played the most natural move, developing the only undeveloped piece rook fd8 all this move has all the hallmarks of a good move right he develops an undeveloped piece controls d7 now he's about to play mid game every one of his pieces are touched but it's still not the best move what a master should see in this position not just immediately deal with that immediate threat but also long term plan of his game you see, as I'm going to double my rooks, which is an obvious plan and good plan, on the C file, 
he should eventually double his rooks also. Oh, so so what should he have done? Rook c7. Rook c7. You see, in the actual game, he played rook d8. Look how many moves it took him to double rooks on the c file. He played rook fd8. Later on, he played rook c7. Later on, he played rook f, rook d, c8. It took him three moves to double rooks. When he could have done it in two moves, rook c7 followed by rook c8. So he lost the move. The position is not open, so losing a move in a semi close or close position is not such a big deal. So after rook, he, he saw the threat and played rook fd8, I created a threat and he saw it. Fine, let's continue with the plan. I play rook c2, intending rook a c1 next, doubling rooks. So this is the part of phase two of my plan, activating my rooks. It's his move, and here he played queen a5. Okay, what could possibly be the point of this move? Uh, oh, back rank. Well, I, well, I can play rook here. My back rank is covered. But what do you think, Kelly? Rook c1, queen takes a2. Right, if rook a c1, I drop this pawn, and this is the base of this little pawn chain. That means this is going to fall next, right? So I spent about 15 minutes, my second longest time that I spent, not on one move, but on a plan. What to do? So I analyzed the position, and I play rook ac1 anyways. Now it's obvious that I want him to take the pawn. Did he take the pawn? No. Did he see what my plan was, what my threat was? No. no. But there's something else that helped him to figure out that he should not take the pawn. And I asked him after the game, by the way, did you see what I had in mind had you taken the pawn? He said, no, but I figured a master never gives you a free pawn or two. So you see, his intuition helped him. His analysis did not. And he was absolutely right, by the way. I just set a trap for him by offering this pawn. What do you think would have happened had black taken the oh, right. a2 pawn? D4? Mm, rook a1? No, on d4 he just takes another pawn. Rook a1. Rook a1 and uh, he takes the pawn. My rook is, this rook would be hanging. C3? No, it's not an obvious one. It's a very deep plan. D4? D4, no, he takes this pawn. D4 now, after a queen takes, oh. after D4, he just takes another pawn. But then you get a pawn back and you take the rook. No, I'm on this three times, right? But he's defending it. Well, he can always move the, move the queen back and take this pawn next. <coughs> so the, the plan is a little bit deep. Had he taken the pawn, this is the combination that I had in mind. First, I play knight takes f7. You see, eventually, I want to move this bishop with a threat and pref prefer to capture something. But in order to do that, I must get the knight out of the way first. And of course, if he takes the knight with the king, now I play bishop takes knight with two serious threats. One is check, king here, mate, and the second one, is winning the queen. And this is absolutely lost position for black. Well, and let's see what happens if he doesn't take the knight. If he doesn't take the knight, and let's say he takes the second pawn here, again, I have a choice between winning another pawn, so the two pawns that I give up here, I get on the king's side and destroy the king's side castle, or take the rook and be one point ahead materially. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a knight here. Good point. <laughs> Maybe it's not there. <laughs> okay, at least somebody's not asleep. Okay, so, well, like I said, he never took the pawn. He deprived me 
of a nice combination. So my point is intuition can help improve your game too. You have a gut feeling. Even world champions, they've admitted that there are times that they have no idea which way to go. There are two different continuations and they have no idea, analyze the position to death and they still have no idea which way to go. That's when they rely on their gut feeling. I have a feeling this continuation is better. I like this better. It looks good. So intuition can also help your chess. So what did he do? He didn't take the pawn. Instead, he played bishop f8, safeguarded the checkmate square that I was hoping to do. OK. It is white to play now. And what should he do? You notice that my two phases happened. I shifted my queen to the king side, phase one. I activated my rooks, phase two. Phase three never happened that I planned for him to advance his a pawn, and he never did. So phase three that I planned for him never materialized. So I had no idea what to do at this point, honestly. I remembered Alkine. When he had some tough positions and he had no idea what to do, he would get up from the board and go to the other side of the board and look at his uh, from his opponent's position. I mean, it's the same board and pieces, but you'd be surprised you see things differently. You really see things differently. So I remembered what Alkine did, and I did that. I went up, looked at the board from my opponent's side, which, by the way, it has an added benefit of making your opponent nervous. What is he doing behind me? Go back to your seat. So I did that, and I figured if I'm black in this position, what's my best plan? So I looked at things from black's perspective. And I figured if I'm black, I can't, I can't stand this knight sitting here so nicely. I'm going to challenge his next move with knight d7. Right? That's a very good move for black. Sometimes when you don't have a plan, you neutralize your opponent's good pieces and challenge them and trade them. So I went back to my board and I said, I must prevent knight d7. I have to come up with a move to prevent that move. And I found the move. What do you think white should play to prevent black's knight d7? Create a pin on the knight. By playing what? Uh, well, he can still move the knight. Oh, yeah. He can still play knight d7. Not queen h4, but you're close. Move, the, move your knight to c6. I can play knight here, and this looks good. And if he plays rook takes, I'll take this knight. But you see what happens after this. Rook takes, bishop takes. He just moves the rook here, and I have no more threats. And what happened in effect, two knights got traded. But I have a space advantage. And when you have a space advantage, the last thing you want to do is to trade pieces. So yes, this could have happened and looks kind of flashy, but objectively is not a good move. So knight c6 doesn't help. The move that I came up with was queen f3. See, with every little, these little queen moves, I'm creating a new threat. But this move has a preventive role. It prevents blacks from playing knight d7. What happens on knight d7 now? Queen check, knight takes, he loses four points immediately. So I play queen f3, and of course, like I said, he's a solid master. He was 2300 plus at this time. He played rook c7 with two goals. One is to defend this weak square f7, just in case. And, and second, to double rooks. Of course, even with rook c7, this move is still no good because I still play queen takes check. Check and take immediately drops two pawns. So knight d7 is still not playable. It's white to play now. And so far, I left this pawn here undefended for him to take. But he never took. Here, 
it's white to play, but if we were assumed it was black to play, taking this pawn is good now. Because my earlier combination would not work. Let's see. Knight f7, rook f7, and on bishop takes, he simply plays queen b3. He won two pawns here, and now this bishop is pinned to my queen, and next he's going to take the bishop, and then black is a piece up, right? So this combination would not work for me anymore. So, this is the moment that I must defend. I must defend my a pawn. So the first move that came to my mind was bishop a1. This is how usually white defends. Move the bishop out of the way, and it's it's fine. It's sufficient for now. But then I figured once I make this move, it's black to play, and black is going to organize himself with maybe doubling rooks or preparing to warn these pawn pushes. So I figured, why don't I play bishop c3 instead? Because oh, even though I doubled my rooks, immediately I'm not going to play rook takes pawn anyway because this is defended with a bishop from distance. So I play bishop c3, defending and attacking at the same time. Defending and attacking situations are the only ones in chess that they have no exceptions. In other words, they're always good. All the rules and principles and guidelines in chess, they have exceptions. Most of the times you go with the rule, sometimes you break that rule. This one, creating a defense and attack at the same time, has no exception. In other words, it's great. So I played bishop here, and he played queen b5. Okay, looks like a good safe square for now. So again, I had no idea what to do. I envisioned two plans, two phases. It happened. There's no phase three, didn't happen advancing his a-pawn. This is when I came up with another phase. Sometimes you plan and you figure it's not enough. So you add another phase later on once your earlier phases materializes and it happened. So now I have to come up with a new plan. So when your pieces are in best squares and you cannot improve their position even better, think of how the pawns can help you. Obviously, I wasn't going to touch these pawns. I mean, I could play a4, and queen takes pawn is bad because of bishop here, forking their rooks, but he doesn't have to take it. He could just go back here, and he's fine. In the meantime, I weaken this pawn for the rest of the game. I don't want this to happen. So this is, is out of the question. So how could the pawns can help me? Now I could think of advancing my kingside pawns. But you're not supposed to push pawns on the king's side, right? All the chess books, chess authors, they tell you, do not advance pawns in front of your king. It weakens your king. But even that rule has an exception. So this is where I added another phase and decided to advance my g and h pawns. And this led to a nice victory for me. These two pawns are not participating in the game. So let's bring them to the game. So I advanced my pawn to g4. You see, when black has this kind of pawn structure, and h pawn is the one that is most forward, you want to engage this pawn with a pawn on g5, preferably defended with a pawn. If black's pawn structure is like this, you want to challenge this pawn structure by engaging the most forward soldier by playing the pawn on h5, preferably defended with a pawn on g4. So when you want to destroy a kingside castle, that's why it's a good idea to provoke a move like this or like this on black side, because this has potential to be a target later on. So basically, what I want to do is to challenge that pawn, defend it with a pawn, this kind of pawn structure. So I started with g4. g4 is better than immediate h4. There's a problem with immediate h4 pawn because black plays h5 and it weakens this square. Now I can play g4 still. Trouble is a lot of trades take place. Pawn takes, knight takes, knight takes, queen takes. 
And even though white is slightly better, the position is not good enough for a win. But on g4, he cannot advance neither one of these pawns. Pushing the h pawn falls to g5, and white wins the pawn if he plays knight g4. And if he goes somewhere else, he just drops the h pawn. And g pawn, of course, is not playable because this knight would be hanging. So I played g4, and he played rook d c8. Finally, doubled his rooks. So as you see, both players, they double the rooks on their c file, ready for action to take place, and the game opens up. They're both prepared. But like I said, neither one of these pawn pushes are good for the moment for black. And of course, white didn't want to do that either. So I played h4. So with this move, my intentions are clear. I'm about to play g5 next and dislodge the knight from this square. And I'm bearing down on f7 twice once the knight moves. But for the moment, it's defended twice. But the good thing is knight cannot retreat to this square because I'll take the pawn check. So he has to go to either h7 or e8. So masters usually don't wait for their pieces to come under attack with pawns. And then they move that piece out of the way. They usually do it one move in advance. If you see any top level games, masters, world champions, they've done this quite often. He's, this guy is also a solid master. So he played knight e8. Okay, he moved the knight out of the way. What should white do? He should continue with his attack anyway. g5. And I'm about to play pawn takes, pawn takes, move the king, bring the rook, and attack along the g-file. And of course, if he takes, which he did, after pawn takes, pawn takes, we have this position. And remember I had mate threat on g7 earlier? Well, it's got it three times, no longer my target. Okay, I have a threat on f7. Double attack is defended, double defense. As a matter of fact, he defends it one more time with this move next three times. But these are not my targets anymore. I have a new, much better target. H7, H8. It's the H file. I made checkmate him on H7, H8, and that's my goal. To attack and strike along the H file. He is well protected these weak areas. But now look at the H file. So the plan is very simple and very effective. Just put two majors on the H file and deliver checkmate. How can he possibly stop? How can he try to escape? If he ever plays a move like this, well, it's white to play now. And I was considering queen h5 or queen h3. The more I analyze the position, the more I like queen h3 better. One point of queen h3 is that if he plays, I'm sorry, in this position, it's black to play. And black played knight e6, d6. That's when I played queen h3. And I'm trying to put a rook behind it and deliver a checkmate. Pretty straightforward, nice plan. And if he tries to escape with, say, f6, I could play queen takes pawn check. But there's a saying in chess, when you see a good move, look again. There might be a better one. This move is by far better. It's like the na last nail to his coffin. And there's nothing he can do to prevent the mate. So f6 is not playable. When you want to have a successful attack, you have to look at every single possible defensive moves that your opponent can create against you. So he pl what about g6? Would he stop the mate? Well, not quite. He will get mated. This is the thing you've got to keep in mind when somebody pushes a pawn. When a pawn is pushed, like in this case, g6, you have to look at the squares that the pawn used to control that is no longer controlling. And how can you put pieces on that square and create threats? So had he played g6, I would have played knight g4. See, I'm taking control of these squares now. With an immediate mate threat. And there's no defense now. So if he plays, for example, bishop g7, I trade bishops, takes, takes, check, 
year and mate. All of a sudden, my pieces are swarming on the king's side while these pieces are dressed up nowhere to go on the queen's side, which is nothing is happening. And this is an example of weak planning. So I played queen h3, and my opponent was still thinking of f6. He possibly overlooked that g6 is very strong. And on f6, he was worried about queen takes check. So he brought the queen back all the way to e8 square. And I knew that he played that move, thinking that he could play f6. So it's white to play now. And how can I finish him off here? Just put a rook behind the queen, right? Yeah. So the move that I had in mind earlier was king g2, followed by rook h1. And it's a good effective plan. It wins, no doubt. But then I realized that I don't have to bring the c1 rook behind the queen. Thanks to this rook on the second row, I could bring this rook. So here I played f4. And I'm about to move the c2 rook to h2 and try to deliver checkmate. And there is no way he can escape. Again, f6 falls to g6. And the only way to stop the pawn or stop the mate is to sacrifice the queen for a pawn, which loses the game also. And g6 falls to knight g4. That wins straight too. So it was his move. And I noticed that. He's spending a lot of time thinking. So I went to the other side of the board again. Mm -hmm. Now I'm looking at it from black side. Is there any way black can save the position? Well, there is one way that delays the mate, not even stop it, but delays the mate. And that is knight f5, and on rook h2, knight h6. Well, like I said, this delays the mate. It still leads to checkmate. Because I take the knight here, and if he pushes the pawn, I have check, and let's say king h8, knight f7, double discover checkmate. Isn't that beautiful? Those are the best looking checkmates, double discover checkmate. Okay, so. No, he could have. And if he plays pawn takes pawn, I had in mind to play rook g to check. If he moves the bishop, I play queen takes, threatening mate. Plus, I could move the knight out of the way, attack it, the bishop one more time. So that would definitely lead to checkmate. Or he has to sack the house pretty much. And if he plays king a7, how does white win? There's a simple but very powerful move for white. A knight move? Nope. Oh, queen g3? White makes a move and it's checkmate next move, no matter what black does. Queen g3? In other words, this is a mating two position. Queen g3 or queen g4, either one. And it's mate next okay. on, on g8. And if he moves the bishop here, Queen g7 mate. If he moves the bishop here, queen takes. There is no defense to this checkmate. Is this is not what happened. But this is the way that I planned should he try to sacrifice a knight to delay the mate. So here's the position. I played f4 and I noticed that about half an hour passed, and this guy has still not moved. So I went to the other side, and I tried to see if there is any way black can save this position. And I didn't see any way that he could defend. So he spent 45 minutes until he ran out of time. And then he said, oh, I lost on time. And I said, I'm on the board. But there are some opponents that they don't want to give you the pleasure of checkmate. 
when you have a totally winning position and they know they're going to get made it in two, three moves, they just sit and sit and sit until they run out of time. Right, so nothing wrong with this as long as you win, right? As long as they resign, fine. Whether it's on the clock, or if they make them feel better to say to their friends that I lost on time, that's fine with me. Either way, you get one point anyway. So one thing that we can learn from this game is black was simply reacting to white's moves. In other words, black had no plans of his own. And it's not a good way to play chess with no plans and just react to your opponent's threats. Black doubled the rooks on the sea file and he was preparing for this push that never happened. Neither one of these push pawns ever pushed. So he was just reacting to white's plan and one of the good things about Kali's setup, if you have not chosen a white opening repertoire for yourself, or if you like to add that to your repertoire, Kali's setup is a kingside attacking oriented setup. And often the positions end up with white blasting on the king side. Because white's strength is on the king side. Black's strength is sometimes in the, in the center, sometimes on the queen side. Black could have had a much better position had he advanced a a pawn with a rook behind it. It would have been an entirely different position. It would have made it a lot harder for me. And I'm not even sure if I could have won. I was hoping to win, but that would have made, definitely made the game much more exciting. So you could say, okay, white's rook doubled up on the C file, but they never delivered anything on the C file. True, sometimes it happens among masters. They're so equally positioned, I mean, uh, a strength, that you cannot do whatever you wish and you're hoping to do. It happens at the very top level all the time. Like but you see, it is still paid off. With this rook coming to the h2 next. Okay, I line up all these for a queenside assault. Turned out that his kingside is extremely weak. The h file is my best ace. So h file is what I'm going to deliver checkmate. Hope you guys enjoyed the game. This was a three-phase plan, four-phase really, one of them never happened. What I envisioned for him, he never did. And with this game, I became city championship of Houston for another three years in 1996 through 1999. I had the title from 1990 to 1999. Hope you guys enjoyed it and good luck with your own planning in your game. Thank you.